Okay. Okay. Good to see everybody. Today, I figure we'll start learning about Hanukkah. Hanukkah is on the 25th. It's about less than three weeks from now. It says, Shloshim Yom Lifnei Achag, 30 days before any festival or any holiday, you start learning the laws of the holiday. So we're a little behind, but there aren't that many laws. So I figured I'll skip a week. But we'll learn the laws of Hanukkah a little bit, uh, share some ideas in Hanukkah, not so much the Hasidus and the depth. Uh, that'll save for maybe the week of or a week and a half before, another week and a half. Uh, Hanukkah is unique in that it is celebrated by so many Jews around the world, and it always has been. Um, and as I spoke about before, most Jews observe it in the most stringent way, the st most stringent manner. Now, when it comes, for example, and not everybody, uh, yeah, you don't have to wear tzitzis, right? I, those little strings. If you're a male, especially, you know, for women, for sure not. If you're a man, the mitzvah is only to do it uh, if you have a four-cornered garment. Most of the times we don't have a four-cornered garment. We don't wear ponchos really anymore. So we don't have tzitzis on it, those little tassel strings. And there are those that will go out of their way, uh, especially chassidim, to buy a four-corner garment and so that we can fulfill the mitzvah of putting on tzitzis. It's a mitzvah. We'll take any advantage. Um, but nevertheless, you don't have to. Some would say that's stringent. That's like a stringent way to do it. Um, what are some other, many other ideas? Okay, like uh, when it comes to the walls of a sukkah, the walls of a sukkah, you only need two and a half walls for it to be a sukkah with schach on top. But uh, more stringent, the most stringent would be to have a third wall, and the most stringent would be have four walls closed in, and you'd have a door. That's the most stringent way. And you would find that the majority of people don't do that. When it comes to Hanukkah, everybody does the, mo the most stringent way. What's the most stringent way to observe Hanukkah? Um, the first night you light one candle, the second night you light two, the third night three, four, and so on. That's the most stringent. All you really have to do is light one per night, like we said before. So there's something unique about that. Um, I don't think any other holiday is like that. Pesach, Passover, uh, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. We don't, people, there are more stringencies. There are different levels of stringencies and uh, people don't, you know, people do whatever they want. But when it comes to Hanukkah, like 100% of the people do it this way, which is incredible. It speaks about Hanukkah. So there's something unique about Hanukkah. There's something very cool about Hanukkah. A, a, a well, an un, I think a story that's not uh, especially connected to women, Hanukkah, because um, there's a beautiful story that we'll get into. And that's a beautiful, beautiful and gruesome and incredible. Okay, so what actually happened on Hanukkah? I'm looking inside of something called the Sheva Hamoyedim, which is uh, laws of, of uh, it's all in Hebrew. I, don't, I couldn't find it online. It's basic. It's like Kitzer Shulchan Aruch. It's like the Kitzer laws, like um, abridged laws, the most, the most necessary laws with the customs, uh, customs of Chabad. Yeah, you joined the Chabad. Uh, you're going to Chabad classes. I'm going to tell you the Chabad way because it's the only way I really know. Um, so what happened? So there was a, in short, the Jewish people, as we tend to do, we became a little bit less observant, more secular. Uh, we started reaching higher ranks in society, um, education. We had the Greeks, so there was a lot of education, a lot of enlightenment, you, as they would like to call it, um, you know, felt part of society, high society. And what happens is when you become, yeah, you, you hate the cool kids and you're like, always oh, thinking about I'm better than the cool kids. Until the cool kids start accepting you, the cool kids. And then you're like, oh, yeah, forget everything I said in the past. Now I'm part of the group. Yeah, you're part of the group, um, which is unfortunate because then you don't look at your own qualities, special qualities, and to use them out in the most proper way. You just conform because, oh, these are the most popular. Let me conform to the most popular. So the most popular people at the time were the Greeks. And... Uh, the biggest enemy of the Jews 
has always been the Jews themselves. We've always turned on each other first. Um, yeah, the most difficult taskmasters in Egypt were the Jewish taskmasters. You know, they were appointed by other Egyptians. They had like, you know, the Egyptian taskmasters, and then they would appoint these Jews um, to be taskmasters upon the the Jews and watch them. And, you know, they understood the language. They would really make life extremely difficult for the Jewish people, for their own people. We saw that by the Nazis. We saw that by the Russians. The Yvexets, uh, how do you say Yvexia, Yvexia, um, which Stalin, after 10 years, thought they were too Jewish. And these were the worst people, headed by um, a student of Tel's Yeshiva who had rabbinic, who was a rabbi from the Tel's Yeshiva, an incredible um, Torah scholar. And he became the most hardcore communist and sent thousands, hundreds of thousands of Jews to their deaths in a period of 10 years. Um, he was the head of the Jewish, uh, the Jewish taskmaster group. Um, anyway, yeah, once you become accepted, that's what tends to happen. Purim, the same, same sort of story, but there was something unique about Purim, which we will, which happened a couple hundred years before the story of Hanukkah. But um, so what happened? I started getting uh, to high society and um, they started, and the Greeks had a certain ideology, a certain philosophy, and they did not believe in the concept. They didn't believe in spirituality, the concept of godliness. Um, like we spoke about earlier, they didn't mind us learning Torah. You can learn Torah as a, as a intellectual pursuit. And in fact, they very much uh, admired the scholarship of the Jewish people and of the sages. Um, and that's one of the reasons why it was considered so great to be in Israel and in Jerusalem in particular to be amongst these people. But they were trying to recruit them to join their own group. Yeah, join us. Use out your mind for other great things. Um, and it's no doubt that the Greeks did bring great certain, you know, advancements in technology that the Jewish people always accepted and always op with open arms, even till today. The those who don't accept, um, you know, technology, not to worship technology, and not to use it out necessarily in, not to use it out in, uh, you know an improper way, but to use it out in a proper way, like the internet is an incredible tool, possibly one of the most incredible tools, top five in the history of humanity, um, but it could be used out for good and for bad. But the Jewish people would very much embrace technology um, and uh, use it out. But the Greeks said, you're either with us or you're against us. So what, what was their goal? Their goal was to, uh, to get rid of all Anything that didn't make sense, anything that wasn't logical. Brismila, yeah, they got rid of circumcision, which is kind of a problem now. Uh, um, New York, New York, it's always up for uh, debate in, in, the, uh, in the politics of New York. Um, European countries, for sure. I mean, Belgium got rid of, you can't have a, you can't do shrita, you can't slaughter animals. You can eat meat, but you can't do shrita. Um, even though it's humane, whatever, it's its own little, uh, I have to learn a little bit more about the details, but yeah, they got rid of, they said, okay, Bris Miller doesn't make any sense. Kosher doesn't make sense. Outlawed. Um, Tzitzis doesn't make sense. Outlawed. Um, but uh, honoring your parents, for sure. Uh, learning Torah, whatever, as a scholarship, for sure, you can go ahead and do that. So that's what they try to do. They try to get rid of all the spirituality. Now, it was a group of people um, of Kohanim called the Hashmanayim, Hasmanayim in English, I guess. Uh, the Hashmanai family, they uh, led by Yehuda Hamakabi. Uh, Maccabi is an acronym, or Maccabi is an acronym. The letters are Mem, Kaf, Beis, and Yod, which stands for Mi Kamaycha Be'elim Hashem, who is like you, God. Um, in other words, he said, you're either with God or you're against God. And they called themselves, well, the people called them the Maccabees, Maccabean. Um, and they formed armies and uh, underground learning 
programs, just like they did in the times of the Germans, and especially in the times of the Russians. Tremendous underground networks of schools and, uh, you know, uh, mikvahs and books, sedorim, anything it was to keep the Jewish people alive and going. And really, they were trying to just get rid of, outpace their own people. And what happened? They went ahead and uh, defeated the Greek army, the tremendous victory. Um, but that wasn't, uh, that was only after they destroyed, the Greeks destroyed our temple. They destroyed the Mizbeach, the altar. And once the altar is not there, you can bring it, you can, uh, the Rambam says you can have an altar, according to the Radbaz, you can have an altar without any other parts of the Beis HaMikdash, of the Holy Temple, and bring sacrifices. Um, so they, but they destroyed that. So we couldn't bring, uh, even after we won the war, it was a period of time of trying to get the, uh, the Holy Temple back into place. Uh, not only did they bring the Mizbeach, the altar, did they destroy it, but that was, they also put like a Vodazara, idol worship types of things, pigs in there, you know, just to make it really drive the point home. Um, and we came back, they won. Um, there was other stories that happened, and one of them we'll get into. They came in, uh, the Jews came in, the Kohanim came in, and they, uh, re they we reestablished everything in the base of Mikdash. That's why there's a Torah reading for all eight days. And what's the Torah reading of the eight days? We learn about the uh, Hanukkah HaMishkan, the um, dedication of the Mishkan, right? What happened? God told Moses how to build the, how to build the tabernacle, the Mishkan, the little base of Mikdash that would travel around with us in the desert. Um, and there was a big ceremony. And there, was, there are certain laws that we have to do. We redid all that during the times of the of term during the times of Hanukkah. We there was a rededication ceremony. There was lots of sacrifices brought. There are certain uh, details. God willing, we should do it again very soon with the new base Mikdash. But there was a lot uh, a lot of fanfare, and we well, those are what we read each day. And Hanukkah Hanukkah has a different few different meanings, and one of the meanings of Hanukkah is Hanukkah establishment, reestablished of the base Mikdash. That's because that's what we did. And the highlight of the uh, reestablishment was the lighting of the menorah. What happened? So there were many menorahs, by the way, in the, in the temple. There were menorahs outside uh, the temple. And there was a menorah, the menorah inside the temple, inside the actual, what's called the Heichal, that little dome, that little, not dome, but that, that little house. Inside that house, it's called the Kodesh, and uh, where we had the showbread. And we have uh, the Mizbeach, the altar, and we have the menorah. No, we don't have the, the Mizbeach there. Mizbeach is outside. But we have the incense offering given in there. And deeper inside is the Kodesh HaGadashim, the Holy of Holies. Yeah, inside it's, uh, this little, uh, a little, a little structure. So on the side there, there's a menorah. And to light the menorah, you can use any kind of oil by law. You can use any kind of oil you like. The best kind of oil is olive oil. And the most, the best of the best, what's called mahadrin min mahadrin, which is a, um, a, a heksher in Israel. If you want to, yeah, there's different levels of uh, what, different levels of kosher. Yeah, because there's different levels of stringen stringency. Mahadrin, in a way, means stringency. Um, in other words, we're very careful with the laws. Sometimes in a law, it says, at the outset, you should do it like this, but if you don't, uh, but if you don't have all the ingredients necessary, you can do it like this, and it's like less stringent. So mahadrin min mahadrin means the most stringent. So the most stringent way, meaning the most beautiful. Hadar, ha, mahadrin also means beautiful from the word hadar, which means the beautiful. The most beautiful way is to have pure olive oil, spiritually pure olive oil, which means the only people who handled it were. Um, People who were in a state of purity, spiritual purity, they had, um, they had gone to the mikvah, and it was sealed by the Kohen Gadol, the high priest. It was a seal. And if the seal was broken, do not use. But the truth is you could use. That, that seal did not exist. There, there was a seal there, and even if it was broken, you could still use it. But the Jewish people, they came into the, into the holy temple, and they saw that everything was destroyed. Yeah, and they came there. Uh, but they really wanted to find, they looked at all the oil that was on the ground all these open containers. And they said, no, we want to have 
uh, the most beautiful oil, Mahajan and Mahadran, the pure oil. And they couldn't find thousands and thousands of jars of oil were all over. And they found one, one that was, it was a great simcha, a great joy. They found one pach shemen, one container. I don't know how big it was. Maybe it was like this, whatever, of olive oil. And they said, oh, it was a great miracle even in finding it because it was incredible. How did they miss it? The Greeks were very particular and they had groups of people going in to make sure to uh, make everything impure, spiritually impure. You can imagine they had how many people they had, the, how many troops they had at their disposal to make everything impure. And they were very careful, very methodical about it. And yet they missed this one. Still, nevertheless, they missed this one um, little, little uh, container, pach. And they found it and they lit it. They used that from the menorah. There was a great joy. And the miracle was that what happened? It takes the miracle was that each day the oil would go down and they would come back the next day. The Kohanim would go back into the Heichal where the menorah was and they would see the oil was came back up. Obviously, a miracle of miracles. You know, we can't, I can't appreciate how much of a miracle I don't, I don't know what that means. Um, but why eight days specifically? We spoke like we spoke about yesterday. It takes eight days, it takes four days to travel to the north of Israel to get those special kind of olives that you need to uh, big fat olives to make olive oil. Yeah, you don't use those little olives. Certain type of olive that you have to use. They took four days to go there, four days to come back day, come back down. So they dispatched somebody right away, but it was going to take eight days until the oil was made. And Hashem made a miracle that the uh, oil was there. Uh, that was enough, to, the oil, the, the menorah kept burning because of Hashem had such great uh, pleasure, such great nachas. Um, that we wanted to do it the most beautiful way um, and stick it really to the Greeks. And we ultimately um, were back in control of our land for another 200 years until it was completely destroyed um, by the Romans. And that is called, that is the, uh, the exile we're in. We call it, it's called the Roman exile, uh, which was, it was destroyed 200 years later. So that's like the basic story that everybody knows that everyone's familiar with now. So the big miracle was really with, um, it's kind of unclear, actually. What's the bigger miracle? The defeating of the army or the oil, you know, the whole oil. But the oil really represents what Hanukkah was about because, again, it was this spiritual war. That's really what it was. They wanted us to forget that it was your Torah, God, meaning the Torah of God. They said, you want to study the Torah? Study the Torah. But don't say it's God's Torah. And that... That was the real, that's, it's the spiritual war. It's the, it's the lighting up of the darkness, which represents, that's what the menorah is. It lights up the night. Uh, the light, the light of Torah, Torah is called Or, Torah is called light. And that's really what the miracle is about. So we've really focused mainly on that aspect of, of Hanukkah. So there are lots of laws. Um, oh, I just want to mention, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, when was Hanukkah established as a holiday? The following year. It was not established that year. They weren't sure if it was going to be a, the, the, the sages at the time weren't, wasn't sure if this is going to be a continuous miracle. In other words, is this something to make a holiday about? What's a holiday in Judaism? There were many miracles. We have miracles all the time in your own life. The, the, the Torah attests and we say in our Siddur, if you really look at and analyze your life, you'll see miracles. There are miracles. But do they recur every year? Is it part of the, and we say miracles, because time works in a spiral. Uh, we've spoken about many times in the past. I'll share that video with you that we made, that I made last year, about how time works. Miracles, the, the, the miracle of Hanukkah, the spiritual energy of Hanukkah was always in existence since the beginning of creation. Whatever Hanukkah represents, and we'll get into the Hasidus of it and the Kabbalah of it, but it didn't, it, it was always in existence and it didn't make it into our world um, until the Hanukkah story. That's when it became revealed. Why does God reveal things at certain different times? Why does the Torah, why wasn't the Torah, why was it 2,000 years until the, or 2,000 years until the Torah was given, you know, 2,500 years, 3,000 years? Why did it take so, because it wasn't necessary. 
whatever it was, the Torah, it took this many years for the Torah. God said, this is when the Torah needs to become revealed. This is when Abraham needs to be born. This is when Noah needs to be born and do what he needs to do. Now, so the energy of, of Hanukkah was always in existence. And it came into, uh, re it revealed itself, made it into the world of Asiya, our world, when Hanukkah came about. But the sages aren't sure, is it, is it something which always began in creation and therefore it should be marked and celebrated? And there's, But what does that mean? That it should be applicable in our life. There's something to be gained from this every year. There's something we're supposed to be doing to tap into that spiritual energy to help in our service of, of Hashem and have an impact upon the world. Is that so? They waited until the next year to see is the miracle occurring again? And whatever that spiritual energy was, what, however, that frequency was there again. It came back every year. And now we know that there's it happens every year. The miracle of Hanukkah, that miracle of the oil, and we'll get into what that means, occurs every year. Um, and so they established it the following year. Um, it wasn't established at that time. So let's just get into some law. So since the main miracle has to deal with the menorah, it seems to be that is the emphasis. The Jewish people, we focused on that. We believe that is what the miracle was about. The spiritual war on the world, yeah. Um, that, that's what we focus on. So therefore, there are lots of laws. Well, there are some laws with regards to the menorah. Um, and that's what I want to focus on. Okay, so... I just want to tell you a couple of laws over here before we go. So Hanukkah is considered a, a, a miracle, a time of uh, great joy. And like most joyful times, most joyful days, you have to, uh, the question is, do we have like a, do we eat? Do we eat on the, do we eat and drink on that day? Do we make a sauda? Do we make a meal? So typically we don't. There are some people that do. Um, typically we don't. Um, but we do eat a little bit more than usual, and we uh, we celebrate each night. People will have uh, people will make a meal. Chabad, I don't really see it happen so often, but you know, obviously there's donuts and latkes. Why why donuts and latkes and all these different things? Again, the, anything with made made with oil, that because that's where we're focusing. Oil, oil, Torah, Torah refers to oil, because Torah, oil always rises to the top. Um, so the same thing. The Torah always rises at the top. But no, there's other other reasons for oil. So we have oily foods, and we Question. try to make a we try to make a big uh, big celebration, a little bit of a like a, a little of a, a little event each night. Um, we say Hallel every day. Hallel is reserved for times of miracles, giving uh, thanks to Hashem. So we have Hallel every single day. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, this may be a little bit off topic, but could you define soda? Like what makes a meal a meal? Yeah. Uh, yeah. cause you could certainly like satiate yourself off of yes. donuts and latkes, yes. uh, but it's not like a, you know, it's a great question. A, a soda is with bread. A soda was, is with bread. Now a soda mitzvah, a soda means a meal and a meal always refers to bread because you want to make the birkat hamazon after. The Birkat, you want to say those blessings of the Birkat Hamazon. You can only say the Birkat Hamazon if you have bread. A Su'udis Mitzvah, when you really want to make it to the, you know, Mahadrin, to the next level, you add wine. You should bring in wine. Because it says, Ain Simcha Ella Babasar Vayayin. There's no joy unless there's um, meat and wine. Now, we don't exact, you don't always have to have meat. Um, but wine for sure. Wine is something that we... So you should, you should bread. So Uda means a bread means bread. Um, okay, I just want to say women are obligated to take part in the mitzvah of the menorah, and we'll get into more details of what the menorah, the laws of menorah. We don't have much so much time. But we'll do that next week. But women have a mitzvah to be take part in the menorah. Now, we don't necessarily women like Havdalah, It's better not to do it yourself. It's better to be in a in a home with somebody else that's lighting. Obviously, if you're in your own place and there's no one else going to light, then you should light your own. But uh, for the most part, you should have somebody else light. However, women have a custom of sitting by the menorah for 30 minutes and not doing any work. Now, you're allowed to do work on Hanukkah. But women have a specific, there's a specific mitzvah upon women or a specific halacha 
for them not to do any work and just sit by the candles. Because the miracle was really in great thanks to the women. What happened? Fantastic story. I'll just tell you really quickly. There was a woman named Yehudis, Yehudit. She was the daughter of the Kohen Gadol, of Yehudan, the Kohen Gadol. Now, she was in a place where the army, what our general, and without getting too many details, we were in a siege. The Greek army was trying to penetrate inside to Jerusalem and get into where they had, they had to go, trying to destroy us. And we defended very well. But, however, the army, the Greek army was very strong. And they decided instead of trying to go in to fight, let's just siege them. So we will besiege it. So they cut off all supplies. They surrounded it very tightly. And they said they're eventually going to starve. And they're going to run out of water. And, you know, the first thing you do is you cut off electricity, water, um, food, and you make them very weak. And you can either the, the, the enemy will give up or they'll die. You know, one of the two will happen or they'll be so weak that you'll be able to go in there. Um, and they were very concerned. The Jewish people, the, the army at the time, the Jewish army was very concerned because they didn't know what we we're going we're to starve to death. And uh, they started rationing food. And Yehuda said, Yehuda was famous for her cheese. And she said, um, I have a plan. She went to the general and she said of the Jewish army and said, I want to bring, I'll bring, uh, let me befriend the general or the leader of the other of the Greeks. And um, I plan on, I'll kill him. I, I have a plan. And they said, whatever you want to do, it's fine. So she said, you give me some information that I could give to him so that he'll believe me. And every day I'll come back and forth and I'll tell them different things that's going on. And let's be on the same page. Say there, he said, let's do it. So she goes in, she brings a bunch of cheese with her. Um, no, no, she doesn't bring cheese. She goes in and she, uh, with her, with her servant, her helper to the Greeks, they capture her right away and take her to the general. And she said, I'm here to, I don't trust my people anymore. They're going to die. Let's just get it over with and kill them. And he's like, how can I believe you? And she started giving him information and they checked it out and it was true. So each day and night they would go. And she said, I have a plan of how to go in and just destroy all the, you know, to take over, to invade. And, uh, they, they work out this plan, you know, she's obviously lying, whatever, you know, but uh, whatever, he believes her. And a week, the night before the great invasion that they had been planning for a long time, her and the general, so to speak, you know, she was planning with him. She said, I want to bring a, I want to bring you some of my cheese as a way of celebration. I make fantastic cheese. And he said, great. And uh, she, she comes with cheese and with wine. And, uh, and, um, he, she starts, she was beautiful and he wanted to seduce her. But so she knew that and she started giving him lots of cheese, salty cheese, but she made sure there was no water. So she just kept giving him more and more wine until he became so drunk that he passed out. She took his sword. She chopped off his head. Didn't stop there. She took the head and she walked outside of the tent through all of the, uh, she, she wanted everyone to see. She walked around carrying his head and they were so freaked out, the Greek army, that they ran away. <laughs> and with that, the Jewish people were saved. So that's the story of Yehudas. And uh, our army was able to regenerate, rejuvenate, uh, get the energy needed to fight off a real battle that was to come which we fought elephants. There were elephants. The, 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 you learn about elephants. Um, and that took it. So women have a very special obligation to sit by the Hanukkah menorah because they're part of the miracle. I mean, without Yehudas, we probably wouldn't be here. Okay, so we will get into more of the details, the real nitty-gritty details next uh, next week and then in the weeks to come. Um, does anybody have any questions? Sorry, there wasn't so many laws. But I think it's okay. <laughs> okay, we'll talk. We'll we'll begin. So tonight uh, is Mordechai Goodman, and then uh, we'll pick back up tomorrow with Siddur, with prayer. Okay, that goes on everybody.